Thank you very much for the invitation to come to the IES. <laughs> it's great here so far. So I'm talking about representations of PRD groups. So for those who are less <laughs> interested in the special program, let me first tell you what PRD groups are. So P for me is a prime number, so two, three, five, whichever you like. So it's fixed throughout the talk. And then most of you, uh, everyone is familiar with the real numbers, which are just the completion of the rational numbers with respect to the usual absolute value. And now the periodic numbers, they are also completion. So they are completion of Q also with respect to an absolute value, but this time with respect to the periodic absolute value. But the periodic absolute value for integers is just defined as the periodic absolute value of P to the S times R, where P and R equal prime is one, to the P, uh, one divided by P to the S. So in other words, the more often the number is divisible by P, the smaller the periodic absolute value is. So two numbers are close if the difference is often divisible by P. So this means a periodic um, number can be written as a power series in P that where if the, the exponent of P um, grows, I mean, you, you sorry, it's a po power series in, in P where you start with A minus N, P to the minus N and so on, and then you can go up to infinity because if the exponent grows, then the number gets very small. And how do these objects look like? So the real numbers everyone knows is just a real line. Well, the periodic numbers, they can be thought of as a fractal. So if you try to draw them topologically, you end up with a fractal. So this means that the real numbers, they are connected, while the periodic numbers, they are totally disconnected. So topologically, these two things, they behave very differently. And that's very important for us, because of course, one important property is that the real numbers, they only have one compact subgroup. Because if you take a compact subgroup that's non-zero, it has some element, it has all its multiples, it's not compact anymore. Mm -hmm. But for the periodic numbers, there are infinitely many compact subgroups. So for example, we can take ZP, which is just the completion of the integers. So it's power series where we don't have negative ex exponents of P. But we can also take P times ZP, P to some power times ZP, or P to some negative power times ZP. And these actually form a neighborhood basis of zero. So this means we have a very interesting situation here. So these are the periodic numbers. What are now the periodic groups? So for the real numbers, you might know the Lie groups, so like GLN over R, SLN over R, or those that preserve some inner product or some symplectic, symplectic form. And we can do now the same thing, but instead of using R, we use QP. And that's what I call a periodic group. So again, GLN, SLN over QP, or those that preserve some inner product, some symplectic form. And then there are also some exceptional ones. All right, so these are periodic groups. What do we want to do with this pe these periodic groups? So let's say for the rest of the talk, G is our periodic group. What we are interested in is to study the representations. So we want to construct all the representations, by which I mean irreducible, smooth, complex. Um, complex means, so these are representations, so these are maps from G into the group of automorphisms of a complex vector space. And for us, this complex vector space is most of the time infinite dimensional. Irreducible just means no non-trivial sub-representations, so we just look at the building blocks. And smooth is some technical term, it means that the stabilizer of every vector is open, so that we get a category that's interesting to study, where we can say something about it, so that that's not going to be too crazy. All right, so how do we do this? So we know that there are certain building blocks. These are called supercusp representations. So if you ever hear the term supercusp representations, you shouldn't be scared. It just means building block for these representations, literally. I mean, all the others can be built out of these supercuspidals by something well known, which is called parabolic induction representation theory. And the supercuspidal ones are those that do not appear in some non-trivial parabolic induction. So what we really want to know, know is how to get these supercusp representations. The problem is they are really mysterious. For GLN, we know the story thanks to the work of a lot of mathematicians during the last half century. But for general groups, much less is known. So 1998, the first construction for general groups beyond GLN and some classical groups, some small examples, was given by Jeff Adler. And then three years later, um, JK, JKU generalized this construction vastly. So that in 2007, Julie Kim, who is also here, maybe not in this room right now, but at the IES, she actually showed that use construction gives us all representations. But with the caveat, she assumed that this prime is very large. So this means if the prime P is very large, we know the whole story. 
But still, the question is now what happens for small primes p? And unfortunately, use representations do not give us all representations for small primes p. So we have to work harder. We have to do something else. We have to find something new. And so recently, in 2014, Mark Reeder and JKU, they gave a new construction, a slightly different construction that has the property that it works for all primes p. And what they construct is so-called epipelagic representations. So what are these epipelagic representations? So more and said, they define the notion of depth. So if I give you, if someone gives them a pre representation, they associate a depth to it, which is a non-negative real number, so zero or positive number. And the epipelagic representations, those are the ones that have smallest positive depth. So why do we call them epipelagic representations? It's because of oceanor oceanography. In oceanography, the upper zone, zone of the ocean, so the, the zone of smallest positive depth, it's called the epipelagic zone. And that's where the word is coming from. So Mark Reeder actually, when I asked him why did he call it like this, he told me that he thinks of representation as some fish swimming in the ocean. And yeah, then it's obvious how to call them. All right, so. It's a process of parabolic induction. Better than endoscopy. Yeah, it's better to talk in a plane about <laughs> epipelagic zone than endoscopy. Okay, so how does, how does the construction work? So as input, they take something which is called a stable vector in the moit preset filtration. Just take this as the name for the input right now. I might say a few words about it if time permits at the end. Then they do some construction, which is pretty easy. It's just some, some compact induction. So everyone in representation theory really knows the step very well. And the output are these representations. So all we really need are these stable vectors in the moit preset filtration. And of course, Rita and you didn't just write down this construction without telling you that stable vectors exist. So they gave a classification of the ex existence of these mysterious objects. The classification is really nice. It's in terms of combinatorial objects. Together with some collaborators, they showed precisely for, for each group, they told us where these stable vectors exist and where not. And it's formulated in some combinatorial terms that do not, that is independent on the prime p, that doesn't depend, uh, that doesn't see the prime p, but the result assumes that the prime p is large. So even though, the, even though the, the, the classification itself doesn't see the prime, they heavily rely on it in the proof, which is a pity because earlier I told you for very large primes, we know already what's going on. So why do we assume for large primes here now? So some of my past work was in this area, so what I did is I studied this moit facade filtration, which is part of the input here. I gave something like a global model for it. So the moit facade filtration of a periodic group, and it's a filtration of the periodic group, and the periodic group is associated to a prime p, a fixed p. What I did is I constructed something that allows us to compare this filtration for different primes, or the quotients of these filtrations. And this allows us to move between these filtrations for different primes and deduce results for small primes that previously were only known for large primes. So one application of this new study of these moi preset filtration quotient is that we now obtain stable vectors for small primes as well. Uh, part of it is in a joint paper with Beth Romano. And as an application, this means using this machinery, we get now new supercustal representations. And they are now really new. They are for small primes p, and they didn't exist before. All small primes. Uh, in your yes. yes, so my, yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, I haven't really told you what group G I'm considering, but I go beyond the tame case oh. and I can reach all primes. Um, there's a slight, okay, let's talk about this later. It's getting too complicated <laughs> right now. Um, but that's very general. So I, also, most people usually, in representation theory, everyone usually assumes the group is tame, and I go beyond the tame case as well. But that, these are just some details. Okay, so that was my first work. What to do next? So I've told you about, I mean, we have this ocean with the epipelagic zone. We get new epipelagic representation. So the obvious question is now, what happens at higher depths? For large primes, everything is fine. But I'm, what I'm interested in right now is to look at the deeper parts of the ocean for small primes and find all the remaining supercuspid representations. So that, that's one of the projects I'm currently working on and keep working on here. 
And then afterwards, or in parallel, I'm also interested in how do these representations fit in the Langlands correspondence. Because the Langlands correspondence says that, or predicts that to each representation, we can associate some number theoretic parameter called a Langlands parameter. It's roughly speaking a representation of the Galois group. So it should somehow relate the representation theory to number theory. And that's another project that I'm interested in. Okay, so let me tell you a bit more about the details. So what goes into this um, construction of representations? So all the representations so far, they are constructed in two steps. The first step is, or the second step, depending on your viewpoint, is that we build the representation of our group G from representations of compact subgroups. And that's why it's important that we have all these compact subgroups that I talked about at the beginning, like QP as a compact subgroup, ZP, and so on. So for example, in order to get representation of SLN QP, we might want to start with representations of SLN of ZP. And second step, in order to do this, we have to now study the representations of these compact subgroups, and that's what we do with the Moipassat filtration. And that's where the Moipassat filtration comes into the game. Okay. Um, am I right that I still have five minutes or am I out of, I didn't, okay, good. That's perfect. So then I can tell you a bit more about the Moy Prasad filtration that. Is this question uh, at the epithelagic level or will it work deeper as well? Uh, so I, th uh, the way you can construct representations in general is from um, induction from compact open subgroups, but um, it's much easier if you start at the epipelagic level. If you start at deeper level, you have to work much harder. But there is already a construction of this? Yeah, I mean, JK, the cons for large primes P, JKU does it that way. He induces them from compact. Small primes, there is some construction already? No, there's no construction. That's what I'm working on. I mean, there are some constructions on my notepads, but <laughs> uh, other than that, yeah. All right, so let me tell you a bit about what the moi Prasad filtration is. Let me just do it by giving you an example. So let's look at the case of GL2 over the periodic numbers. Then a way to define the one possible filtration is we take the compact subgroup. These, this, by this I mean GL2 over ZP. So I writing matrices like this, I always mean they should be invertible. You should think of this yourself. And then we can filter them by taking the matrices that are congruent to one modulo maximal ideal. So frac P just denotes the maximal ideal inside ZP. Or one modulo P squared, one modulo P cubed, and so on. And what's so nice about this filtration is that it allows us to understand this group much better by studying all these quotients and putting all the information together in the end. And the quotients are very nice themselves. So this zeroes filtration quotient, in this case, it's just GL2 by the finite field, Fp. Just, I mean, Zp are power series A0 plus P times A1 and so on. And if you quotient out by P times A1 plus so on, you just get A0, the first one. Uh, which is an FP. And all the other quotients here, they are just matrices over FP. And what's really nice about these groups is that they are all normal subgroups in the large one or inside each other. And so that means in particular G0 acts on G1 by conjugation. And this means we get actually an action of this quotient on that quotient. And this is a linear algebraic action. And this is the space where we look for the stable vectors in. And DPP logic means that we look at this first step here and don't go deeper in the filtration. And what I'm going to do next is to go deeper in the into the filtration to construct the rest. So this was an example of one filtration. Let me give you an example of another filtration. Instead of starting with the matrix that has ZP everywhere, you can start with a slightly smaller subgroup by putting here already a P in. And then we have to go down in two steps. So we first go down on the diagonal, then on the off-diagonal terms, then again on the diagonal, then again on the off-diagonal terms. And these are the two filtrations that appear after conjugation. So that's, I didn't really, I didn't only show you two examples, I basically showed you everything, roughly speaking. And again, if you look at this filtration, you also have that the first quotient is some nice group, and it acts on the second quotient, which is just um, matrices with FP in the anti-diagonal terms. Um, OK, I have half a minute. So let me, um, let me just say that the idea is that whatever group you take, whatever filtration you take, you always get this nice quotient. The first one is always a nice group. It's called a reductive group over the residue field. All the other quotients are some vector spaces of FP, and you want to you have always this action, and studying this action, you can 
get information about the compact group and the representation in the end. And one of the applications of my previous work was also to give an explicit description of these quotients. Okay, and let me finish with this, and thanks for your attention. <laughs>